Well, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me a chance to say a few words uh, about my current <coughs> research, uh, which I'm working on right now, which is dealing with the transnationalism or the national issues in the diasporas of various Eastern European communities uh, and the issue of representation, rather non-representation of controversial issues uh, pertaining to uh, the Holocaust and, and other uh, examples of ethnic conflicts in the post-Soviet space. I should say right away that my background is that of an historian of Ukraine and Belarus, and I've been working uh, for the past 10 years on the case of Skodny, the, the eastern borderlands. So Lithuania, uh, I sort of drifted into this territory by default, uh, because I've been working on Lviv, and the parallels to Vilnius are, in so many ways, uh, very, very striking. These are cities, Vilnius and Lviv, that uh, are well suited for comparative studies. Both were cities which had very large Jewish uh, populations. Vilnius, 43% uh, Jews, according to the Polish census of 1931. Lviv, 32%. Whereas the populations that now dominate the cities were, uh, well, in the case of, Lith of the Lithuanians in Vilnius, all but non-existent. There were 12 families speaking Lithuanian in the 1930s in, 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 in Vilnius. The Ukrainian segment, which now totally dominates uh, Lviv, which is sort of like the heartland of Ukrainian nationalists, Ukrainians constituted 9%. Lviv and Vilnius were Polish Jewish cities, uh, going through a, a process of a total uh, change and transformation of population. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the post-Soviet space, the post-Soviet era, uh, area, uh, I think it's possible to talk about certain groups of countries. And there's one group of countries when it comes to memory politics and memory representation which show a lot of similarities. And one group here is the group of countries which have a background as Axis associates or satellites. Certainly Hungary, Romania, but also Slovakia, uh, Croatia. And to this group, I think you can also count uh, areas which aspired to establish national uh, entities or re-establish them such as the case of Ukraine and Lithuania, where the initiative, the impetus for this change in 1941 came from groups which belonged to the very far right and political spectrum and were directly sponsored by Nazi Germany. So I'm looking at two groups here. In the case of Ukraine, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which had their headquarter in Krakow, in the General Gouvernement. Uh, they split with a larger organization in 1940, uh, supported and uh, uh, aided by the Nazis. Uh, and you have the Lithuanian Activist Front, which was created in Berlin in December of 1940 and uh, January 1941. And both groups came about and were radicalized at a time when uh, it became clear that Nazi Germany would renege on their alliance with Stalin's Soviet Union and were preparing for Operation Barbarossa. So in many ways, it makes sense to compare the Lithuanian and Western Ukrainian case. Another uh, striking uh, similarity is, of course, also that the diasporas during the Cold War period also were strikingly similar and dealing, uh, in getting into defensive mode in the late 1970s and early 80s, particularly as the Holocaust became a topic of uh, focus and inquiry. And in some cases, in the diasporas in North America, coordinating their, their, their activities in, in sort of uh, reflecting or deflecting or rebutting uh, allegations of Ukrainian and Lithuanian involvement in the Holocaust. <clears throat> and during this period uh, that I'm focusing on, uh, and the period which has been the most uh, complicated to come to terms with in these territories, the period of 1941, the period of the pogroms and the anti-Jewish violence in this territory, uh, again, has the similar distinctions in the sense that both uh, the Vilnius area and the uh, part of Western Ukraine, which used to be part of Poland, went through not only one, but two occupations. In the case of Vilnius, even had three occupations, which was transferred briefly to Lithuania in 1939. And during this period of the Soviet occupation in 1939 to 1941, and in the Lithuanian case, uh, 1940 to 41, this was an extremely brutal Soviet occupation. According to the best uh, estimates that we have, at least 
17,485 people were deported from the Lithuanian SSR in 1940 to 1941, and all in all, in all about 30,000 people were subjected to political repression and various forms of abuse and torture during 1940-1941. On the eve of Operation Barbarossa, the Lithuanian Activist Front prepared for an uprising in Lithuania to restore Lithuanian statehood. And in many ways, it made sense for them to assume that, would, that this would work out. Uh, after all, Slovakia in 1939 were able to establish uh, a satellite state uh, with, with the support of Nazi Germany. April 10, 1941, the Ustasha were able to carve out an independent uh, puppet uh, Croat state. So of course, on the 23rd of June 1941, as the Wehrmacht were marching into towards Vilnius and Kaunas, the uh, Lithuanian activist front took up arms to establish Ukrainian, uh, sorry, a Lithuanian state. At the eve of this, uh, what's now known in Lithuania as the Lithuanian National Uprising, they printed leaflets uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, statements such as, the fateful hour of final reckoning with the Jews has come. Lithuania must be liberated not only from the Asiatic Bolshevik slavery, but also from the age-old yoke of Jewry. The ancient right of, of refuge in Lithuania, granted to the Jews during the times of Vitalikas the Great, is completely and finally revoked. Every Lithuanian Jew, without exception, is hereby sternly warned to abandon the land of Lithuania without delay. The Jews are to be expelled completely and for all time. The government that it restored, established in 1941, again here you have a parallel to, to the Ukrainian case. The leader of the Lithuanian activist front, Kasis Shkirpa, was still in, in, in Berlin, and his deputy, Josas Abrasevichus, uh, uh, who after the war took, this, took the name Brazaitis, became the acting prime minister of Lithuania, the so-called provisional Lithuanian government. And uh, it only existed for about uh, five weeks, but during this, this short existence, it established that Jews, and here's a direct quote from, 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 the, from the meeting of the Lithuanian government, Jews are to be set in separate localities selected for this purpose, and on the left side of the chest were a yellow eight centimeter circle with the letter J in the middle, end quote. And the accompanying, uh, the, the Lithuanian national uprising was accompanied by a wave of anti-Jewish violence. Uh, an estimated 20,000 Jewish victims uh, were, were killed uh, be between the German uh, uh, attack and the establishment of the civilian administration in August 1941. And in many cases, these Jews were killed before the German troops arrived. You have a similar situation in uh, Western Ukraine. Here, exactly one week later, on the 30th of June 1941, again, Bandera's deputy, Yaroslav Stesko, Bandera was still in Krakow, but Stesko declared the Ukrainian state restored on the 30th of June, 1941. Stesko himself uh, um, was the acting prime minister and, and kept referring himself to the acting prime, as, as the prime minister of Ukraine for the rest of his life. As Ukrainian state was declared on June 30th, 1941, and the UNBE were disseminating leaflets urging the population to take up arms against the uh, uh, against Jews. Narode, znaje Moskva, Majari, Zhadova, Sepse, Tvoje, Varohe, Nishti. Znaje, so people know that Moscow, the Majar, the Jewry, they are your enemies. Exterminate them. Know that your leaders are the leadership of the Ukrainian nationalists. Your leader is the Bandera and we are seeking to establish a united Ukrainian state, Slava Ukraini, Heroyam Slava, which was the, the own slogan. And these leaflets were distributed, distributed uh, across not only Lviv, but in many areas around Western Ukraine. And similarly to in Lithuania at this point, between 35 and 140 pogroms, depending on how you count, whether you count the number of violent acts as one or as, 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 as separate incidents, 35 to 140 pogroms broke out, and the victims tallied between 13,000 and 35,000 Jews in Western Ukraine, also in some cases before the German troops arrived. Uh, of course, the Germans, the Nazis, were not interested 
in treating the Lithuanians or Ukrainians as allies. Uh, there was not a lack of love from the, from the side of the UN and the LAF, but Adolf Hitler and uh, his, the group around him were not interested in treating Ukrainians as satellites, but really, really as areas of colonization and settlement and exploitation. Uh, had the Germans prevailed in the war, prevailed in the war, uh, it, it's likely uh, to happen that there would have been some form of policy to exterminate also Ukrainians and Lithuanians. Uh, in the Generalplan Ost, they uh, saw no future for Ukrainians and Lithuanians. The uh, SS uh, uh, had plans to Germanize this territory, and they, they concluded that only about 20% of the Lithuanians are of sufficiently high racial quality to be Germanized. Uh, and there were plans to essentially uh, recreate uh, all Indo-European forests in Lithuania and populate them with the animals uh, uh, which have since been uh, extinct, like the aurochs and so on. So the Lithuanians would not have fared really well under a German victory, and neither would the Lithuanians. But of course, I mean, this is not the place to go through the details of the Holocaust in Lithuania and, 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 and Ukraine. But, so I, I jump a little bit forward here. And, in 1944, with the return of the Red Army to Western Ukrainians and to the Lithuanians, this was not, of course, seen as a genuine liberation. Uh, in the period between 1944 and 1952, 118,000 Lithuanians were deported into the interior of Siberia, and 203,000 Western Ukrainians uh, were also deported into Siberia. Uh, but many of the leading figures in the both of the LAF and the, of the UUN, they ended up as displaced persons in Germany and later on immigrated to the United States and Canada. And here they came to play an important role uh, in the Cold War. After 1948, nobody, or should I say nobody, but few people actually took a detailed interest in the Holocaust and in uh, the, 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 the uh, legacy uh, of, of the murder of the Jews. The fight against communists became, of course, overreaching uh, uh, concern. Uh, and many of these people, including uh, Ambrasevichus, uh, were recruited uh, by the uh, uh, OSS, later on, that later on was renamed the CIA. So uh, Yuasas Ambrasevichus uh, became, uh, he was hired by the CIA. Uh, he was brought to the United States in 1949. And the same thing happened with many of the leading OUN members. Uh, I was trying to find a good illustration for this. This is a Christmas card sent by Abrasevichus to the CIA, wishing them a happy Christmas, 1956. Uh, they were hired for the purpose of fighting communism. They were not particularly interested. The Americans had no love necessarily for these far-right groups, but they could instrumentalize them against uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and it was clear uh, in the CA assessments that nationalism remained a significant power to be reckoned with in Western Ukraine and in the Baltic states. And uh, these people, the leading nationalists, often had a detailed knowledge of the emigrant communities, of the microgeography, and as long as there was an uprising going on, uh, a rebellion, they could be used to, to uh, as liaisons with the Lithuanian and the Ukrainian uh, uh, soldiers, uh, the soldiers fighting uh, the Soviets. Ambrasevichus Brasaitis was more successful than the leaders of the UUN. Uh, Jaroslav Sesko, uh, uh, his group, uh, they came to become the backbone of the so-called anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations. They took a much more radical position than the Americans. They were interested in organizing a multinationalist rebellion in the Soviet Union. They coordinated the Ustasha uh, emigrant groups, uh, former members of the Tiso government, Romanian Iron Guardists, Hungarian Cross Arrows. And the idea was to organize a synchronized multinationalist uprising in the Soviet Union, take control of the nuclear weapons in Ukraine, and re aim them against Moscow. Uh, and they did not shy away from a nuclear confrontation. This was something the Americans couldn't accept. It was one thing the Americans in the 1950s feared more than communism, there was the possibility of the Soviet Union being dissolved into a galaxy of potentially failed states, possibly the nuclear weapons. So the Americans washed their hands of the, the UUN and supported the third-hand man in, in, in the UUN. They had a brief renaissance in the early 1980s. Here you have Jaroslav uh, uh, Stetsko, who did work for the CIA in the 50s, but then they, they broke the relations with them 
uh, the main sponsors of the UN in, in exile were the, uh, the government of Nationalist China, Chiang Kai-shek, and Francisco Franco's Spain. Uh, they also got funding from uh, uh, South Korea, Sigma Marie. But other Reagan were partly brought back into, into uh, the warmth of, 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 of the uh, Western community. Uh, well, why is this important? Well, this is important because these narratives that came to be exported to post-Soviet Lithuania, post-Soviet Western Ukraine were at this point developed. The Lithuanians were actually pioneers in using the term genocide instrumentally. The term was, of course, coined by, by Lemkin uh, right after World War II, but as early as in 1948, the Lithuanian emigrant community started using the term genocide to describe communism or describe Soviet rule in Lithuania. And mind you, this was a very, very brutal, of course, uh, regime under Stalin in particular. But already in 1948, Ambrasevich himself wrote a book translated into English, a small nation is being wiped out. And Lithuania, an appeal to the United Nations on genocide, 1951. Here's the director of the prime minister who argued for the internment of Jews into the concentration camps in 1941, 10 years later, evoking the, the genocide argument to present communism as a genocidal ideology. And the Ukrainian community started to internalize this narrative by 1951, 50, 52, 53. For the 20th anniversary of the famine in Ukraine, the term genocide was, was then in use. Uh, and this narrative was developed and became very strong in these communities, uh, particularly after uh, 1978, when the miniseries The Holocaust ran on North American TV. And then with the Demyanyuk saga, uh, uh, John Demyanyuk being arrested and sent to Israel and being sentenced and later <coughs> released, this was a sort of galvanizing moment that brought together Lithuanian and Ukrainian emigrant communities and often coordinate their activities to sort of deflect the idea of Ukrainian and Lithuanian involvement in the Holocaust. Soon thereafter, less than five years thereafter, Lithuania was actually leading the march towards independence in the Soviet Union. And this narrative of genocide, of Soviet rule being genocidally uh, of genocidal character and aiming at exterminating the Lithuanian and Ukrainian people became very powerful in time of minutes, hmm? in, in, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, time and time again, uh, uh, it was repeated in parliamentary debates that in the Second World War, Lithuania had lost no less than one third of its population. And they could even give an exact number, 780,922 inhabitants. That included, of course, all people being expelled from Lithuania. That included not only the Jews killed, it included the Poles expelled from Vilnius, Germans from Klaipeda, Lithuanian emigres, and so on. So they were all put together within this larger picture of genocide. The describes is the politics of genocide claiming 780,922 lives. And in 1992, in April, they opened the Museum of Genocide uh, Victims in Vilnius in, 1920, in 1992. And in nine, since 1997, it has been run, this is a poor picture, but it's, it's been run uh, as a government agency of Lithuania, as part of an in institution called the Genocide and Resistance Center of Lithuania, which was established in 1997. And here's how they present the revolt of uh, 1941. Uh, uh, an armed revolt broke out after the beginning of the war. The main aim of it was to establish the independent Republic of Lithuania. Partisan troops all across Lithuania took over the premises of former local governments, disarmed retreating members of the Red Army who had been separate from the units and form, uh, formed local institutions. Over a few days of the revolt, 162 rebels died in Kaunas, about 700 in all of Lithuania. The 20,000 Jews being killed by the rebels are forgotten. And this is a museum called the Museum of Genocide Victims in a city with 43% Jewish population in 1941. So it was a museum which did not at all, with one word, mention the Holocaust before 2011. In fact, the only word that starts on holo is holodomor, which, they had the, which is the Ukrainian uh, term for the famine. And in, within this narrative of, of a widened definition of genocide, uh, you, uh, they include the, the, the holodomor. Uh, and here, here's one of the placards from the exposition. In Auschwitz, 
uh, we were given some spinach and a little bread. War is terrible, but famine is even worse. So the, the, the reference is explicit. And uh, this museum in the bill, uh, here's how it represents also uh, well, the, the Soviet occupation. After 2011, when they actually opened a, a tiny exhibit about the Holocaust, they add little, a little plaque down here for you, because that is the major, of course, is, of course, but Soviet oppression. But then they attach a little plaque to this, just willing to get acquainted with the period of Nazi occupation in the period and the Holocaust more extensively, because there wasn't anything else, of course, uh, before 2011. We suggest visiting the Vilna Gaon Jewish State Museum, which is located in a little wooden building 500 meters behind this gigantic uh, museum of genocide victims. Uh, but there's now, of course, there is now an exhibit. And as Egle Rinsvesjuta argued yesterday, they're just arguing that there is a movement in the right direction. And I guess this is a step in that direction. But it's still a museum on gen of genocide which leaves little space for the Holocaust. So this was a step forward. But we also have steps, depends on your perspective, respects ba uh, steps backward. In 2012, Ambrasevich was was reburied in Lithuania. He was flown back, his, his, his body from New Jersey, and was buried on the full state honors uh, with the presence of uh, the former presidents Las Vergas and uh, Adamkus, uh, and the clergy and leading members of, of course, the Institute for Genocide Studies being present at his funeral. Uh, the Vitautas Magnus University in Kaunas, where he lived, had an auditorium renamed after him. The partners in Ukraine uh, is the, uh, uh, the museum at Lonsky Street in Lviv. In 2005, Viktor Yushchenko was elected president of Ukraine. He started a policy very similar to that which had been carried out in Lithuania, uh, a policy of instrumentalization of the past, very heavily focusing one step, one leg of this narrative was the, that the famine was a genocide, a deliberate genocide of the Ukrainian nation. and even came up with an exact number of genocide victims. The exact number was 10,068,000 people. That included 6,123,000 Ukrainians that were never born, that would have been born had it not been for the genocidal families which aimed to exterminate the Ukrainian nation. But that was official, that was official narrative by the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory. Stepan Bandera came to fill the role partly of Abrasevichus in Lithuania and Viktor Yushchenko here, uh, shortly before he left office, elevated Stepan Bandera uh, to an official hero of Ukraine. And in 2005, a museum in Lviv was opened, modeled on the Lithuanian Museum of Genocide Victims, and its curator and director, uh, Ruslan Sabili, explicitly describes the museum mm -hmm. as a twin museum to that of uh, Vilnius. Their leading representatives have repeatedly been in, in, in invaded, uh, uh, invited to speak in, in, in Vilnius, at the, in the Seimas, and they have sort of reaffirmed each other's genocidal stories and exchanging information. I'm, doing, I'm on 17 minutes now, three minutes, I, I, I'll be done. And if the Lithuanian Museum is usually, well, largely their sin is a sin of omission, a museum of genocide in the heartland of Ashkenazi culture in the Jerusalem of Eastern Europe, a museum of genocide not touched upon the Holocaust. Well, that is, many people found this problematic enough, as, as Egle yesterday uh, uh, said. The Ukrainian museum is more problematic in that sense that it was run by the organization of Ukrainian nationalists in Canada, which sponsored it. It was run as a front organization of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and also supported by Yushchenko's Institute of National Memory and had an overlapping role and they're also affiliated with the Ivan Franco National University in Lviv. June 30th, 1941. Uh, this is a very famous picture of a woman absolutely devastated and grief-stricken at the day the Wehrmacht marched into uh, uh, Lviv. This is at the Lansky prison where they have now organized a museum of Ukrainian genocide victims. What you see here is like what the, the NKVD did before they retreated in, in panic on June 28th, 29th, was they shot, they murdered several thousand inmates that they had in the prisons. They did not have enough uh, railroad cars to evacuate the prisons, so they murdered them. They went cell by cell and shot them with machine guns, throwing hand grenades, 
and a carnage, massive bloodbath took place on the 28th. Two days later, the, Red, uh, the Wehrmacht marches in, together with Ukrainian battalion Nachtigall, which was read by, led by the UNB, commanded by Roman Shokhevich, who later on came to lead the UPA. What they do is they, when they get to the uh, Lonsky prison, they bring out these bodies for identification and burial. But the people that brought them out were not the Ukrainians themselves. You see these people in the background sitting along the wall. These were Jews gathered from the street of Lviv. You can see they have come from different social classes. Some are dressed up very elegantly. Others were simply workers. So here they're sitting along the wall, being guarded by Ukrainian nationalists. They were forced to rebury the, 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 the victims, uh, uh, which were mostly Polish, but many of them, 9% were Jews. Some were Ukrainian. And after the, they reburial the victims, uh, the message that this was the work of the Jude Komuna, the Jewish communists, the pogrom broke out. It was used as a pretext for the pogrom, which claimed between 700 and 6,000 victims in, in Lviv, depending on how I count, uh, Ukrainian victims, German victims, and so on. How is this represented in the museum of, of, of uh, the uh, uh, Lonsky prison? Well, in the Ukrainian case, it's actually photoshopped out. Here you have the, you're zooming in literally on what is assumed, and any visitor would assume would be a Ukrainian, a grieving Ukrainian woman looking at Ukrainian corpses. And the Jews in the background are literally photoshopped out, covered with statistics. And of course, the, the, the impression you get is that these are Ukrainians. 1,681 victims at Vyatista Pershing. Uh, uh, and the image was also appropriated by the Lvivska Miskarada, the Lviv uh, uh, City Council, which for uh, May 9th, the Dien Peremohe or Dien Pabili, the Victory Day, uh, which is a big celebration in, 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 in Russia and in Belarus, and also in Eastern Ukraine, they printed uh, big posters covered Lviv with this, saying communism equates Nazis. And here you have again the Jews being cut out, and you have Ukrainian nationalists uh, being killed by the Nazis. And in the prison, uh, you have this, at the same time, 2012, the centennial of Stetsko's birth. Stetsko, who in 1941 expressed his support for German methods of exterminating Jewry and the expedience of bringing these methods to Ukraine, is being honored in the museum dedicated to genocide also in, in, in Lviv. So, in conclusion, very quickly, I'm on 21 minutes. Uh, I will do my conclusion in 30 seconds. Uh, as the historian Andrei Partnov has argued, the historical narratives of self-victimization, so predominant in Eastern and Central European nationalist discourses, they are aimed primarily and mainly for domestic consumption. At the same time, they're interested in the sense that they are transnational phenomena. They are, to a significant degree, ambiguous constructs, migrating back and forth across the Atlantic, and then within the post-communist setting, finding a resonance within several post-communist societies, particularly those which have a problematic attitude or, or difficult dealing with the Holocaust. There's no coincidence that the three museums which are most, most closely resemble each other, the Terrorhaus in Budapest, the Museum of Genocide Victims in, 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 in Vilnius, and the Lonsky Street prison on <coughs> Stepan Bandera Street number one in Lviv, resemble each other. They are sort of a form of transnational history, uh, which despite their aim for domestic consumption, really are transnational. And this is what I'm working on right now in my, in my, in my uh, research. The whole idea of equating communism and Nazis, red equates brown, and then externalizing the whole problem of communism and Nazism and, and attribute them to an ethnic other very often. Uh, the idea that Ukrainians and Lithuanians were strictly victims, with very little focus on Ukrainian collaboration with the Communist Party, that there actually, that Brezhnev was Ukrainian, Pagodin was Ukrainian, there were actually qu quite a few Ukrainians in the Communist Party, there also the in the Communist Party. So that is part of, my, of my, my, my work. And of course, ultimately, when everything becomes genocide, as Anton Weissman aptly noted, when everything is genocide, uh, nothing is genocide. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the